All right, folks, I have a great opportunity to talk to uh, a great writer. He writes for us. You may know him on the Global Dispatch. He is the author of Truth and Genesis, Herman Cummings. How are you, Herman? Oh, I'm doing pretty well, and yourself? Oh, I'm so blessed, and I, I wanted to uh, get a chance to chit-chat about some of the uh, different uh, contexts in your uh, latest post, and uh, we'll link to that as part of the interview so folks can catch on that. They don't know what we're talking about, but you really have, um, well, first I want to say that I uh, believe that we can have healthy discourse, agree to disagree, and be loving Christian brothers at the end of the day, just like we are at the beginning of a conversation, and I am. I, I go about this to prove that being the case, unlike what many atheists and secularists want to say about us Christians. Now, in your post, you um, kind of go at the um, concept of a trinity and trying to disprove the trinity at least a little bit and trying to explain um, what you believe and kind of kind of help people understand what your point is in the post, and then we can kind of go from there. All right. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you for having me on, and I appreciate it very much. I hope it's a help to someone. Uh, I am of the persuasion that after uh, Yeshua or, the Jew, or Jesus uh, had left, and maybe some 70, 80 years afterwards, uh, various people used to... Uh, come in and started teaching other doctrines after the apostles had died. Uh, Jesus had, an, uh, had a parable that, uh, the, about the wheat and the tares, and um, also a, a parable concerning um, the seed sower. Uh, but what, had, what I believe has happened, that uh, as time went on, people would teach other doctrines, and when it finally uh, was to the point where Rome had, was in control of the world, and Constantine had uh, wanted to look for ways to solidify his new kingdom, uh, well, he's a new emperor, uh, he wanted to find something that would unite the people. For years, he had tried to get rid of uh, the Christians, uh, but that the more persecution that would happen uh, would grow and persevere. And he also did not care for the Jews. So, so what he did was offer a religion that would have some of Christianity, but also a lot of uh, paganism that. Uh, was rampant in the empire, uh, such as uh, worshiping a female goddess, uh, worshiping uh, more than one god. Even Constantine himself was a uh, a worshiper of Mithra, who was a Persian sun god. This is a sun god worship that came out of, uh, I guess his roots came out of Babylon uh, thousands of years ago. Uh, so what uh, was done is that when he had that council meeting in, I think it was uh, 325 A.D., he was going to have the scriptures interpreted by Gentiles and did not invite Jews because he didn't want any of them there. He did invite true Christians. That what their intent was to mix in just a little of Christianity, uh, just to please uh, certain people, but mostly have uh, heathen and pagan doctrines. So this is where the Trinity came about, where one would be able to, I guess, see the people they would that were used to worshiping more than one God. Uh, the god of wood, the stone, the river, the sun, the moon, um, and other such uh, gods, um, that uh, this religion would be pleasing to them, the heathens, and maybe it may not be such a great leap for the Christians to accept it since they had certain sound bites of uh, the doctrine that they had believed. 
such as uh, Jesus, uh, the virgin birth, and uh, receiving salvation. So, so what aspects of um, scripture itself? Because I, I want to try to. I, mean, I don't really care as much about doctrine and um, sort of legal practices of different church. We can talk about the Catholic Church, for instance, with the way uh, you know their prayers are acceptable to Mary, for instance. But from a scriptural standpoint, what are some of the scriptures that you um, kind of lean on that really say, "Listen, there's really not." And when you say there's not, like, the, you talk about redefining the Trinity, we're talking about, you know, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. Right? All right. Okay. God first, God first revealed himself to the nation of Israel. Uh, well, as a, as a people. He, he, of course, he spoke to, to Adam, and then the people had... Uh, 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 known, known of one God, but let's say uh, after Babylon, uh, God waited 191 years and called Abraham. God, when he spoke to him, he said that I am the Lord. He didn't say we are. Uh, Trinitarians uh, may want to point to maybe two verses in Genesis where God says, uh, let us make man, when God was actually speaking to other entities in heaven, not to uh, other people of the Godhead. Uh, it was just uh, those, maybe those two verses where God says, let us, or or, or that, uh, I think there might, might be three verses, but I actually tried to count how many verses uh, that God says, I am. Uh, he's not schizophrenic uh, to where he thinks he's three different people in one spirit. And I stopped counting at 69. And if we're going to weigh evidence, two or three verses versus 69 verses where God says specifically, I am first person singular, I would go with the 69. They would in the court of law. So why not uh, our acceptance of the scriptures? Uh, Jesus was actually just the human body that God inhabited to bring salvation to all of mankind since an earthling had to be the one to get back the birthright from Satan that Adam had relinquished. So that was since a, an innocent human being, male, had given Satan the birthright, an innocent, sin-free male earthling had to redeem it back. Yep. And yep. the only way for a person to, only way that could be done is by a male being born without sin. Well, the first and obvious reply I think most people would have would say, well, then who is God reference? Who is God um well, I'm sorry. Let me, let me go on. I even spoke. Um, who is Jesus talking to, and who is Jesus talking about when he's constantly referring to the Father? He is referring to his spirit self. Uh, when we go to Psalms 110, the very first verse, before it was changed by Jewish rabbis because they thought it was confusing, what it said was, Yehovah said into, I'm oh, sorry, I didn't mispronounce. Yehovah said unto Yehovah, Sit thou at my right hand till I make thine, thine enemies thy footstool. This is something that Jesus was, was speaking about when he was on the Temple Mount asking the Pharisees and scribes, Who is the Son or whose Son is the Messiah? And when they said that, uh, that the Messiah was David's son, then Jesus asked him, how is it that David called his son Yehovah or Yehovah? So how can, although the, the English says Lord, but it was, uh, but the original Hebrew would have said Yehovah. And those scribes and Pharisees couldn't answer that question because 
they 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 felt that uh, well, they knew that if they tried to answer, they would uh, embarrass themselves. So that's why it says that from that day they didn't ask him any more questions. But what it is is that Jehovah, our Creator, gave up His spirit existence in order to take on a physical spirit ex- existence in order to give mankind salvation. But I think we still, but I mean, especially as as people that believe in the Trinity, I mean, we're not really disagreeing with you on this stance exactly. We're just trying to say God is so big, he exists and manifests himself into um, three different forms. And make the egg analogy, for instance. He's still just God. He's still one entity. He just has manifested. And, I mean, doesn't it seem pretty clear when Peter, for instance, I think he writes in Second Peter about, you know, our God and Savior Jesus Christ. He's referring to almost, you know, two facets there. And it happens in Scripture, I think, two or three different places in the New Testament after Jesus has appeared. So it becomes clear. And then, of course, the Spirit left behind as a helper. So if if God is not more than, if he doesn't exist in more than one form, then how do we have the the different manifestations all occurring kind of simultaneously? Because that's, I think, how most of us view the Trinity. I don't, I, I agree with you um, very much so when we see, uh, I, I hate to use the Catholics, so I'm not trying to throw all Catholics under the bus, folks, but I think there is some danger in how you idolize and you worship and, and deify certain different things, different other saints and those kinds of things. And the way you handle the Trinity is understanding it's still one God. It's a it's a monotheistic religion. It is not a polytheistic religion as the Muslims like to call us. They like to I mean that's one of their big hang ups with us, right, Herman, is that they, they think that we're polytheistic for believing in the Trinity, right? Yes, as I understand. Yeah. And as an analogy, uh I would Think of the president of the United States. Uh, he is the chief executive, as far as the government is concerned. He is the president for the people. To the military, he is the commander in chief. Three different titles, but just one person. He just performs three different roles. He is he, he's not three different people or three different personalities. See, I just think our, I, I guess for me, I was thinking that our God is so big that he's able to manifest himself into a human form. He, he, hence the reason the son, you know, calls himself son of man. He calls himself the son of God. He, he is a, you know, a, a, a birth entity to come to earth to save us. Yet he still has to exist in his pure, sinless self in the heavens above. And that's why there's two, entities but it's still just him he's that big he's that grand i didn't think of it as two separate things that don't that exist on their own jesus is still just god he's not a different god he's not god b he's not a lesser god he is submissive to the father hence the reason that's the terms that he uses because of the creator but that, and that's that's kind of the part I guess I'm trying I'm trying to work through with you is to try to better understand that and and to kind of flesh this out because it's a very interesting topic in my opinion. Agreed, especially when we have been taught something otherwise and have not grown up in the Jewish culture. Uh, one thing I would like to bring out is that when Jesus was born, he was totally human. He was not divine. If if he was divine, then there was no way that Herod could have killed him when he was two years old. Correct. They they he had, uh, his parents had to take him away and uh, out of danger. He did not become divine until after his baptism, when the spirit uh, of God came upon him and within him, and he went out into the wilderness for uh, to be tempted and, and also to fast, pray, and to subject his 
humanity to his spirit. Yeah, I, I mean, I couldn't agree more. Actually, we were 100% aligned there. I think that is one of the things that is not... I don't know that it's being taught wrong. I don't know that it's just being taught. It's one of those things that's kind of being overlooked. It's like, why would aspects of Scripture describe it a certain way if you don't get his humanness? And if you don't get his humanness, then you don't get why he's the perfect sacrifice. Like, you have to get the human that's the perfect sacrifice to win back what, you know, Satan stole from Adam. I mean, this is kind of... The, this, <laughs> the story makes perfect sense, but you're right. There's a lot of, you know, I don't... I, I'm sure there is false doctrine, but I think more common is is weak or no doctrine. Is that a fair way to say it? Sometimes, <laughs> maybe so. Yeah. Yes, and, and and since he did have to qual in order to redeem, he did have to be a fully human person, and so he is fully human, uh, born on Earth, but he was also divine. Because uh, he had taken on the spirit of Godhead, let's say, uh, what do you call it, uh, cohabitated with him. But after his resurrection, they merged as one. Because it is then that Jesus said, all power in heaven and earth is given unto me. Yeah. He didn't say that before right. his resurrection. When When he's on the cross and, you know, he's... Right before death, there's the famous scripture. It's preached on a lot, and that is, you know, God turns his back, turns away. You know, Jesus represents so much sin, and that scripture talks about the Father turning away. So, again, getting away from the Trinity, how do you reconcile that uh, piece of scripture and the imagery that goes with that? The human sign of Jesus was going to suffer. And even in the Garden of Gethsemane, he prayed, asking, can this cup be taken away, or can that ordeal that he knew he was going to go through, could that be avoided? But as the time time went on, uh, his spirit comforted him, and he do the will of the Father. And I, I say that we say the Father, Jesus said the Father. Uh, and man, what, what is it? What um, scripture is this that Jesus says, God is a spirit, and those that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Yes. We cannot worship him in truth, we don't understand who he is and what he is. Well, so, I, it, so Jesus refers to the Father as his former spirit existence. And uh, there is, uh, I, I would say, wordplay when he is uh, speaking to other people. But when they nail him down, uh, he actually told them, I am God, especially when they, when they asked him, had you seen Abraham? And he said, before Abraham was, I am. He was actually telling him that he was Jehovah. Yeah. And that's, that's what made him want to stone him and call, saying that he was blasphemous. Right. Yeah, agreed. Agreed. Well, I definitely don't think that we... Uh... We disagree as much as some people would like us to when we talk about uh, the uh, Trinity and, and who God is, who Jesus is, who Jesus was, and uh, the Holy Spirit, and trying to understand the grandness, the greatness of God that we believe in as Christians. And uh, it is a fascinating conversation, and uh, I appreciate Herman fitting us into his schedule. Uh, the Truth of Genesis is his blog that we post regularly. Very challenging topics, very interesting topics. Uh, we have just posted the brand new one uh, that came up today. You can check that out as well on theglobaldispatch.com. We'll link to it from this interview as well. So, Herman, I appreciate your time so much, and I hope that you've enjoyed us chit-chatting about some of this and uh, really just kind of exploring it a little bit deeper, getting down the rabbit's hole, so to speak, because I know I have. 
Oh, well, I've enjoyed it, and next time maybe I won't be as nervous. This is my, oh. uh, uh, I'm not accustomed to this. Well, it's, 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 it's fine. You did great. I mean, there's no reason to be nervous. We're uh, just uh, trying to enjoy it and trying to uh, reach out with our faith a little bit, and uh, you really touched on a topic that kind of stirred me a little bit, and that's why I thought it was good to bring it up and ask, and I'm glad you received it and we were able to talk, and uh, maybe we'll... Uh, do it again regularly, and then we'll get through those nerves and uh, put it behind us, and it'll be a regular thing for you, because it's definitely, you, you've hit on some really great topics. I'm, I, I wasn't trying to pick this one out, it just for some reason it seemed like, you know, that one uh, just, I don't know, just struck me as kind of an interesting conversation. That's what I think I thought we would do today. So I thought it was a very good, good, good topic to discuss, so to speak. Uh, ultimately, I just hope that it'd be helpful to someone, even if it's just one person. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. Um, God bless you, my brother, until we can talk again, and uh, take care of yourself. Do our best. Thank you much.